No, Bible prophecy has stood the test of time and it has proven to be more accurate than any other attempt to foretell the future ever. And down through history, men in general have placed great importance on the prophecy of the word of God, not so much in our day today, but certainly in times gone past, men who were biblically educated understood the role that God had around them in their lives and in the world in which they lived. You know, Winston Churchill said on May the 19th, 1940, when he gave this major radio address, which was called Be Ye Men of Valour, he closed his comments with these words. He said, as the will of God is in heaven, so let it be. And in fact, that was the way in which the world understood events in times gone past, that the will of God, he who rules in the heavens, will be exercised in the world we live in. And although we live in a world that today is moving right away from the belief in the Creator and all that God controls, the track record of the Bible and Bible prophecy is uniquely beyond reproach. Now tonight we are continuing our theme of looking at nations of the world as they appear in Bible prophecy. It's a very interesting but educational method of seeing how the God of heaven uses the nations of this world to complete the picture of his purpose. So Bible prophecy really falls into two categories. There are prophecies of events that are now past and we can clearly see them fulfilled. And there are prophecies of events that are still future. And we look to the scriptures to see and understand what their purpose is. And in many cases, we find that the context of scripture and the content of the prophecy reveals pretty clearly to us whether the prophecy is past or whether it is future. For instance, if I talk to you about the prophecies concerning the resurrection of Israel as a nation after 2,000 years of being dispersed, those prophecies are very clearly detailed and the context leaves the reader in absolutely no doubt to their meaning. And so to the Bible student who searches the scriptures, the proclamation of Israel as a newly formed nation in 1948 was a miracle that God had detailed approximately 3,000 years prior to the event. Now, amazingly, the Bible is absolutely full of prophecies that have been fulfilled well after the prophet recorded the vision from God. And these prophecies are what encourages Bible students to know, to absolutely know, that God's word is true and to have absolute confidence in those future prophecies. Now, as we start our comments tonight, I want to make it clear that as Christadelphians, we are merely Bible students who study the word of God and we freely teach it to any who will listen as per the example of the Lord Jesus. And we do this entirely for free because it is exactly as instructed by the Lord. And we only desire to share the wonderful purpose of God to a world that needs his love and needs to understand his purpose. For this reason... I say this because I want to make it sure, clear that what we present tonight is in no way meant to be political. We follow no political party. We have no desire to influence politics in any way at all. And you will find that each of our lectures openly discuss what the scripture message is. And we make every effort to show that as openly and as clearly as possible. Although our subject tonight concerns the country of Russia and how it appears in Bible prophecy, there is in fact no record of the name Russia in most common translations of the Bible. In fact, I think it's in much the same way as our speaker showed us last week that there's no mention of Britain in any Bible passages. And yet he clearly proved that mention is made of the power of Britain through the use of ancient names as well as future events that she will be involved in. What about the Russian people? 
What about this nation of Russia? People who have existed as far back as we can trace to the 9th century, with records of their Slavic people forming under the name of Rus. They trace their roots, the Russians, back to the 9th century. The founding of Kivan Rus, the first major East Slavic state, took place. Kiev, which owing to its strategic location on the Dnieper River, became the capital of Kievan Rus. Uh, in the 10th century, that, uh, 988, Vladimir accepts Orthodox Christianity and began conversion of the Kievan Rus to Byzantine Rite, and so they adopted Christianity. Um, it's not until about 1237 uh, to 1240, under the Mongol domination, that we actually find that there's mention of southern Russia and overlords of Russian princes. But right from the start, we have this, this terminology of this word Rus. There is, as I said, a lot more detail in Russian history between then and now. Not our purpose tonight to look at that. But in more recent times, Russians have been affectionately called Ruskies. In fact, um, sometimes the, the British tend to use that a bit derogatory, but I'm pretty sure that generally around the world it's a, an affectionately used term. And their long history for the Russians has centred around this identification of who they are in the past. But the Russians as a nation are as ambitious as any other nation. And throughout their history, they have fought long and hard to earn their place on the world stage. Many battles have taken place in Russia and throughout Europe for Russia to defend her land. And for this reason, the Russian, Russians over a period of many, many centuries have formed a very suspicious approach to those that come to their doorsteps. Many of us have seen the former might and power of the Soviet Union under the USSR, a mighty group of nations that came to dominate Eastern Europe after the Second World War. And then some of us might remember, if we're old enough, that during the early 1990s, the USSR broke up. Many of the smaller nations under her control previously formed their own independence again. But if you are watching Russia at all, you'll notice that in more recent times, they have moved to absorb many of those countries back into the mother country, usually by treaties and trading, but as we have seen in some countries, resorting to military takeovers when anything else fails. And so Russia today is currently engaged in a number of military endeavours in Eastern Europe, as well as in the Middle East many of which are controversial and have seen Russia's actions frowned upon by groups such as the UN, United Nations, and also NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So what is Russia today? Today, Russia is seen as a modern superpower, ever becoming more modern from a time which not so long ago, she was considered to be behind the times and perhaps not even a superpower. But under Putin's leadership, Russia is sometimes seen as equal to and sometimes seen as stronger than the USA. If you look at Russia's military ranking today, some of the strengths that we see in, um, in even world, I guess, armies. Total population in Russia is about um, 142 million, of which there is around 69, nearly, six, nearly 70 million people available to fight. Of those that are fit for service, they classify about 46.5 million people. Interestingly, every year about 1.3 million Russians are old enough to become um, drafted into the military service. <coughs> Excuse me. Currently, the total military personnel in Russia is 3.5 million people, estimated. A lot of people. Out of that, the active ones, there's about a million, and the reserve personnel sit at about two and a half million. You're talking some pretty big numbers, especially if you're, if you're like me, you're born in, in Australia and you, you know our army's pretty big when it reaches about 100,000, I think, and that might be a bit overambitious. So you look at those numbers and you think, wow, what an incredible size this place is, this power of Russia. But more than that, when we look at what they've actually got I think what's interesting here is not even just the numbers, because I think they boggle our heads a little bit, but the ranking for Russia. So total aircraft strength, 4,000, which is a massive number if you try and visualise, 4,000 aircraft lined up. 
but interestingly, ranked number two in the world. The fighters, nearly a, th uh, nearly a thousand of those, ranked at number three. Attack um, aircraft, ranked at number three again. Transports, ranked at number two. Their trainers, ranked at number three. Total helicopter strength, fascinating, nearly 1,500 helicopters, and ranked number two. Attack helicopters, ranked as two. And combat tanks, 22,000 tanks, ranked at number one. Armoured fighting vehicles ranked at number one. Self-propelled artillery, number one. Towed artillery ranked two. And rocket projectors ranked number two. And I'll just put this up purely to make you realise that, you know, when you're talking about numbers and you're talking about power and strength, Russia is certainly a superpower. Russia has come from a long way back to become a force to be reckoned with. And today, world events on a daily basis mention Russia and her involvement whether it's in Europe, whether it's in the Middle East, especially in Syria, as we know at the moment, and even in American politics, it would seem. Nothing of importance happens without Russia being involved in the world. An incredible picture it is. In fact, so powerful is Russia in the world events that take place today that it is almost inevitable, isn't it, that her involvement in the future has to continue to be, I guess, centre stage to the world's destiny. You can't discount a power so strong. And so what we're doing tonight is we are looking at the reference in Scripture, or in Bible prophecy, in fact, which utilises Russia or the reference to Russia anywhere that we can find. Now, we've read Ezekiel 38 for a reason. And Ezekiel 38, as most Bible students will know, is the one or the, the main place where we will find reference to Russia in ancient terms, according to the recognition of historians. And we pick that up in Ezekiel 38, if you've still got it open there, in the first two verses. Now, this is a prophecy that came to Ezekiel. God uses this term. He calls him son of man. And in actual fact, it's a term that's used also of Christ, the Lord Jesus. And in this prophecy, we see an application in type of the Lord Jesus being applied here because the Lord says to him in, uh, in Ezekiel in verse 2, son of man, I want you to set your face against God. And to set your face against is a terminology in scripture that means to turn yourself against, to be at foe, to be an enemy of. And he's told to set his face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and to prophesy against him. So here's the language, it's against, isn't it? It's a, it's a language which tells us the prophecy is that there's opposition here between the two. There's opposition between the son of man and this power, this Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And this prophecy, as we've read, for our chairman has read for us tonight, clearly describes in chapter 38 a war that is to come upon the land of Israel in the future. We know it's the future because nowhere in history do we have any record anywhere of this battle that has taken place. In addition to that, the nations that are detailed in this chapter, have never yet united in war against the nation of Israel. So our context is events that occur involving the nation of Israel and leading up to battle. Now, the reason why we know it's about Israel is for several reasons. And I've just put here, the Bible message generally, right through scripture, revolves around the nation of Israel. The prophets of God prophesied mostly about events that concerned Israel. And I say mostly, not all, but mostly. And then in this chapter, in verse 8 and verse 16, they tell us that the nations are warring against Israel. And so we read there in verse 8 that they would come against the mountains of Israel. In verse 16, thou shalt come against my people of Israel, as God calls them, and as they are known to be the people of God. And so the prophecy here details a message describing those that are united against the land of Israel in order to create war. Now let's have a look at this verse 2 again. We have some parties identified here, and I've tried to put this a little bit clearly for you from verse 1 to 7, those that are involved in this. So we have the Son of Man, who we're told should be against Gog. And also we are told that the Lord God is against him. And they, go, they were told that in verse uh, verse 3, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee. 
And then we're told that Gog has this identification of, from the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. The nations that are described here are Israel, of course, that they're coming against, and they're under attack from these nations of Magog, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Goma, and Togomar, which are detailed in verse 5 and 6. Notice that the person addressed here by the prophet in this prophecy is called Gog. He also happens to be the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, it says. So who is this person here? Who is this person in this prophecy who goes on to be described as the leader of this united army that's coming against Israel? Well, first we find that the expression chief prince in verse 2 is not tra correctly translated and many other translations have correctly translated as the Prince of Rosh. And I've put up here the revised version. Son of man, set thy face toward Gog, land of Magog, the Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So we are looking at someone who is the ruler over, over a combined area that is described as Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Now, back in uh, around about two or three hundred years ago, this was a subject of great conjecture among Bible students. And you will remember that after coming out of what was known as the Dark Ages and finally Bibles came into people's hands, finally they were able to look at Scripture and start exploring what God's message was, there were many men who were very educated in history who started looking at what these sections of Scripture were about. One that I want to quote tonight is uh, a Christadelphian who put together a lot of work on this back in 19, uh, 1848, and he wrote in Eight Elpers Israel on page 424, he said, he asked the same question that we're asking tonight. What nations are signified by these three proper names? This question has, he says, been long since determined by the learned. The celebrated Bocart about the year 1640 observed in his elaborate researches into sacred geography that Ross is the most ancient form under which history makes mention of the name of Russia. And he contended that Ross and Mosk properly denote the nations of Russia and Moscovy. It is credible, says he, that from Ross and Meshech, of whom Ezekiel speaks, descended the Russians and Moscovites, nations of the greatest celebrity in European Scythia. We have indeed ample and positive testimony that the Russian nation was called Ross by the Greeks in the earliest period in which we find it mentioned. Now, for those that are interested in Elp of Israel, that section is just a very small section of several pages in which he very clearly goes through and defines how he came to this conclusion. Um, for us to read that tonight would take more time than we've got, and it is also very detailed. Suffice to say that he comes to that conclusion and quotes others to verify what was generally agreed some 200 years ago. But we probably need more than one writer to confirm this for us. And it's all very well, I guess, for me to quote a Christadelphian who has established thoughts that we believe are quite right and true. So let's have a look a little bit further. Schofield wrote this. He said that the primary reference is to the northern European powers headed up by Russia. And of course, he's, this is in context of chapter 38, verse 2. All agree Gog is the prince, Magog his land. The reference to Mesek and Tubal, Moscow and Tobolsk, is a clear mark of identification. Russia and the northern powers have been the latest persecutors of dispersed Israel, and it is congruous both with divine justice and with the covenants. So in other words, what he's saying is that uh, very clearly from his examination of this, he agrees with what John Thomas has written earlier. The Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge says, Gog, the prince of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshek and Tubal, by Magog is most probably meant the Scythians or Tartars, called so by Arabian and Syrian writers, and especially the Turks, who were originally natives of Tartary, and by Rosh, the Russians, descendants of the ancient inhabitants on the river Axis, or Rosh. So we start to get a few familiar themes here, don't we? The summarised Bible makes this comment. Many see a reference to the northern European powers headed by Russia in the last days to wage a great war. The reference to Meshech or Moscow and Tubal Zobolsk is thought to be clear identification. The prophecy belongs to the future battle of Armageddon. 
And lastly, B.W. Johnson says, Roche, translated chief, is taken as a proper name by some and probably refers to the Rushi, a people from whom the modern Russians derive their name. So what we really come to understand in Ezekiel 38 verse 2 is we believe that it is making clear reference describing the people of Russia under a leader titled here Gog. And he, that is Gog, we are told, will be enticed to come out to battle against the land of Israel in verse 4. So who is Gog? Well, that we are not detailed in Scripture. We're not given identification to be able to tell us exactly who that person is. But suffice to say, it will be a person who will become a leader, a dictator, who will gather together nations primarily under Russia and those that are mentioned in verse 5 and 6 of this chapter to form an alliance against Israel at the time of Armageddon. But he won't do this alone, as I said. Russia will be joined by those nations in verse 5 and 6. Now, I don't have time tonight to go through who those nations are and I know that last week they were touched on and it is also talked about very often from this platform. However, you can see for yourself some names that are very familiar. What we are particularly interested in tonight is the part that the Bible describes Russia playing in prophecy that is yet to take place. So notice the detail that we are given in verse 4 about the army of Russia. We are told, All thine army, horses and horsemen, clothed with all sorts of armour, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Of course, it was the only way, wasn't it, to describe an army in Ezekiel's day. Lots of horses, horsemen on them, all armed for battle, they've got on their armour, they've got their shields for defence, they've got their swords for fighting with. It's exactly how you would describe an army in his day. However, I think if we were writing this today with our knowledge of modern warfare, which Ezekiel, of course, didn't have, we would probably, I think, with little doubt, be writing about fighter jets and tanks and missiles and drones and GPS mapping, etc., which for all I know might even be extinct by the time the battle takes place. So, of course, what Ezekiel is really trying to tell us in verse 4 is that this army is well prepared. It's set up, it's done everything it can for battle. You know, um, to describe the horsemen being clothed, ready for battle. All sorts of armour. Tells us, what he's really trying to explain to us is that this, this group of people are ready to fight. In verse 7, informs us that Gog and his Russian forces will be engaged in preparation for welfare, warfare well prior to the battle. Look at the verse 7. Be thou prepared and prepared for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled with thee. Be thou a guard unto them. The ESV says, very interestingly, it says, be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. In other words, Russia will be the one that will defend them as well. Isn't this exactly really what our slide earlier showed us? When we looked at Russia's military ranking today, and as a superpower, Russia is ready and keeping ready. And to those who fall in with her, she offers all the protection they need. But in Ezekiel 38, it details for us this battle that Russia and her allies will lead against Israel in the future. And as is shown to us last week, there will be a group of nations under the banner of Britain and the Commonwealth nations who will challenge this move for war. We'll read that in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, which was very clearly explained to us last week how that fits, with all the young lines thereof. And if you have any doubt, um, feel free to talk to us afterwards about accessing our website, which has a video of that lecture last week, and you can go through that yourself and see how well that was described for us. And look what this group say, though, in verse 13. They say, have you come to take a spoil? Have you gathered the company to take a prey? Are you ready for war? What are you after? You want silver and gold, cattle and goods? Do you want to, are you trying to enrich yourself? And so there will be a challenge by others who will, of course, stand guard against those that will t attack Israel. In fact, this battle is described in Revelation chapter 16 as the Battle of Armageddon. 
And it's described as that because it is the battle in which God says he himself will become involved. We read that as our chairman read it for us in verse 16. Verse 16, thou shalt come up against my people Israel. They'll come up as a cloud to cover the land. So great will this power be that they will, they will almost literally cover the land from one end to the other, be like they're under a cloud because it will comprehensively be everywhere in the land. It will be in the latter days or the last days, he says. And I, God says, will bring thee against my land, as he calls Israel, that the nations will know me. God wants the world to know who he is. And I'll be sanctified, he says, he knew God before the world's eyes. And thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old times by my servants, the prophets of Israel? Here we are reading about it, aren't we? Which prophesied in those days many years that I will bring thee against them. And in verse 19, God says, or sorry, verse 18, shall come to pass at the same time, in the same time that Gog will come up to the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that his fury will come up in his face. God will act. He says in verse 19, in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, he says, I've spoken that surely in that day there'll be a great shaking in the land of Israel. God will act through the means of an earthquake and many other things. Look at the description of the earthquake in verse 20. The fishes of the sea, the fowls of heaven, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth will shake at God's presence. The mountains will be thrown down. The steep places shall fall. Every wall shall fall to the ground. Every building will collapse. That's a huge earthquake, a frightening time when the world will see firsthand the anger of God against those who continue to attack his people Israel. He says he will create a massive earthquake, a massive earthquake that will cause devastation around the world. It's actually described for us in Zechariah, which speaks of exactly the same battle. Zechariah 14, verse 2 to 4, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, all nations, and the city will be taken. The city will be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. And then shall the Lord go forth. God will fight against those nations. His feet shall stand, and it's actually a description of the Lord Jesus working on behalf of his Father. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. It will split toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley formed out of that, half of the mountain moving towards the north and half of it toward the south. Now just think about how devastating that earthquake will be. Some of the greatest earthquakes that are described in recent history I think are around 9 or 10 on the Richter scale. Those uh, earthquakes have been so devastating because of the shifts in the earth plates which have related to centimetres. I don't think there's been much more greater than that. And yet the after effects of those earthquakes has been far reaching. This is an earthquake which tells us that a mountain will split in two and there'll be a great valley formed down the middle. That's more than a couple of centimetres of shifting of the earth's plates. That's an earthquake that's going to shift everything around the world as we're told. That's the description of this earthquake in Ezekiel 38. It'll make a big difference, won't it, to the world we live in. But we're discussing, discussing Russia here. Russia in Bible prophecy. And we've seen that she will come up against Israel, joined by a strong group of loyal nations who are all unified in battle. And they will, however, be challenged by allies those gathered under the flag of Britain and her Commonwealth nations. But God intervenes. He intervenes in this battle, causing this massive earthquake like the world has never experienced today. And then what happens? Well, God says, I'll form this battle in verse 22 with pestilence, with blood, 
or rain upon him and his lands and upon the many people that are with him, overflowing rain, flooding rain, great hailstones, there'll be fire, there'll be brimstone, and God will use all the natural elements of the world. In order, he said, that in verse 23, that the world may see that I am the God of all the earth. You know, chapter 38 is an interesting chapter and we use it a lot because it details for us this battle. And it starts in verse 1 and 2 telling us that God has a purpose against God who is going to commence this battle. But chapter 39 tells us exactly how God will do that. And it starts in verse 1 by saying the same thing as, as chapter 38 starts. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against God. And say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. There it is again. And again in verse 2, I will turn thee back, I will entice thee, I will draw thee in. Well, God is repeating the formation of this battle. But then he talks about how he will involve, be involved. He says in verse 3, I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. I will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that are with thee, all those nations that are described in chapter 38, verse 5 and 6. I will give thee, he says, unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field. I have spoken it, says the Lord God. That's the prophecy that God has made of the events of this war which involve Russia. Russia will be defeated by the forces that the God of Israel says he will bring upon them. He will ensure everything goes wrong for them and they will fall or fail by their own inability to perform. Caused, God says, by his intervention. But what's the whole reason? for this outcome. What's the whole reason that God lets this happen? What we do know from scripture is that it's because God has appointed a time when he will bring the whole world under his rule and never to be under man's rule again. Now if you want confirmation of that, look at verse 21. After much description about the battle and the defeat, he says in verse 20, 21, I will set my glory amongst the nations. And the heathen is an old English word for those that were not Christians, if you like. But really, the correct terminology is the nations of the world. And we relate to that a little bit better when we understand that. God says, I'm going to set my glory amongst the nations of the world and all the nations will see my judgment that I've executed and my hand that I've laid upon them. So God is saying, I'm going to reveal who I am. And nobody will be able to deny by the results of what happens. So the house of Israel, in verse 22, will know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. Now, if you talk to the Jews today, not many of them believe in God. Not many of them take much notice of the scriptures. They have gone through some terrible periods in their history and they have alienated themselves from God, their lack of trust in him. And they no longer see that God helps them. They believe in their own strength. They've come to the point where they've had such a dramatic bad events of, events of history that they now say that their own salvation is in their own hands. God says, I'm going to change that. They're going to know from that day forward that I'm their God. Verse 23, the nations shall know that the house of Israel, what are they going to learn? They're going to learn about the history of what's happened and why. They're going to know that the house of Israel went into captivity because of their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore I hid my face from them, I gave them into the hand of their enemies and they fell by the sword. God says, I caused that. You look at Israel's last 2,000 years of grief, I've done that for a reason. According in verse 24 to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done it to them, I hid my face from them. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, now I will bring again their captivity. I'll have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and I'll be jealous for my holy name's sake. This is the purpose of God. God wants the whole world to understand what he has been doing with Israel for the past 2,000 years 
and beyond. And he wants Israel to know it too. You know, in a similar pro prophecy which Daniel was revealed, he, he revealed, he was revealed the, uh, the timeline of events around the kingdoms of men. He, uh, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar saw a vision of this, of this image and we have an artist's impression of the image over here on the side and the nations that that represents. And finally that, nation, that uh, image is knocked down by a stone which represents the Lord Jesus. And again, that's another subject. But look at the summary of this in Daniel 2 verse 44. In the days of these kings or these kingdoms of men, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom? So God says, enough of these kingdoms, now I set up my kingdom, which will never be destroyed. It will be an everlasting kingdom. It shall be left not to other people. In other words, nobody will take it over. But it will break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms of this world so that it can stand forever. You see, this is all about kingdoms, isn't it? And God says the times that men have been able to run their kingdoms on this earth has finished. And now there's only going to be one kingdom. It will be God's kingdom. And that kingdom will be ruled over by his son who has been promised it. Remember the words of, Mary, uh, of the angel to Mary in Luke chapter 1? The angel said, and, and sometimes you read this and think, what's this got to do with anything? in the context of Mary having a baby. But of course it was part of the fulfilment of this purpose of God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. This son shall be great and shall be called the son of God, the son of the highest. And the Lord God will, well, he'll do many things, but the only thing we're told here is that he'll give unto him the throne of his father David. That's the important message that Mary had to hear. God would give this son the throne of his father David. Not only that, he would reign over the house of Jacob, or a terminology for, for natural Israel, forever. Of his kingdom there'd be no end. Now that hasn't been fulfilled. Those words spoken by the angel of God must have some meaning and they must have some time period. Angels of God don't just make these promises to people and then go away and laugh at the fact that we believe it. It actually aligns itself with the whole of scripture. And it aligns itself with the events that are occurring in Ezekiel 38 and 39 when at last God will establish his kingdom instead of men's. But the events that Russia is prophesied to play a part in are detailed to us to serve a warning. And it's really a serving a warning to this world, isn't it? You see, Armageddon is going to be a war of many nations. Zechariah 14 said, all nations. We're told here in Ezekiel 38 and 39 of, of the massive loss of life that will occur. Loss of life that we know always does occur when men choose to go to war. And sadly, such foolish decisions are made in which men just, the expression is, become cannon fodder, don't they? And in addition to that war, the earthquake of Ezekiel 38 and 39, as described in, Ezekiel, in Zechariah 14, will be absolutely catastrophic. As I said, we see our largest earthquakes today, and so many are killed by the forces of nature in an earthquake. Then lack of water becomes a problem. And then hygiene can't be maintained. Disease sets in amongst the survivors. The death toll rises. Other nations quickly throw in all their resources to help and they provide whatever might be needed in order to reverse this tragedy. But this earthquake will be worldwide. This earthquake will leave no one positioned to help others. Everyone will be helpless to help anybody else. In fact, the only one that will be able to assist this world in any way will be the new king. He has the power of God to make everything right again. But where will you fit in this picture? When you see Russia make her move to commence war in Israel, will you be hoping to get lucky and, and survive everything that's coming that the Bible tells us so accurately is about to occur? Maybe you might even be forced to go and fight in Armageddon. 
Or maybe you might be described as those of Revelation chapter 17. And we might go there to the the very back of the Bible with Revelation 17 where there's a vision described of the battle of Armageddon in yet another way. And the Lord Jesus is described there as the Lamb of God. It's used many times in scripture as the Lamb and his involvement in this battle. Here's this king of the earth, the king who is to come, who was promised through Mary to have the throne of David. And in Revelation 17, verse 13, these, that is those that are bringing the war, have one mind and shall give their power and strength to, their, to the beast, to their leader. These shall make war with Christ, the Lamb. And the Lamb will win the war. He will overcome them. Because he is designated by God to be Lord of Lord and kings of, King of Kings. Those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The Lord Jesus at the time of Armageddon will have with him a group of supporters and followers who are the called, the chosen, those who are faithful, those who are not aligned with the politics of this world, those who have through their studies of the Bible, through their application of the word of God, answered the call. They have seen themselves as God has chosen a group of people to work with, their son, with his son. They are faithful to that cause and they are determined to be part of that new kingdom that is to be established in this world soon. How then do you become of those who are with him? It's described here. How do you become those who are called and chosen and faithful? I think you need to find out what the message of the Bible is for you before it's too late, before Russia uses her military ranking by beginning the battle of Armageddon in Israel and we see that devastation that God has said will, man will bring upon this world.